Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Lala Wu, and I am one of the co-presidents of the Berkeley Energy and Resources Collaborative. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to the Berk 2010 Annual Lecture, featuring Peter Darby, CEO of PG&E, interviewed by Bev Alexander, uh, former PG&E executive and current head of the C2M program here at UC Berkeley. The Berkeley Energy Resources Collaborative is an interdisciplinary student organization with over 2,500 student, faculty, and industry members. Uh, and we have, our mission is threefold, to connect, educate, and engage. I hope that you will find tonight's event to be an opportunity for all three. It's now my pleasure to introduce Joey Barr, one of our VP of events, and also the organizer of tonight's event. Thank you. Thank you. Um, welcome, everyone. As Lala said, my name is Joey Barr, and I thank you all for joining us tonight. It's sure to be an interesting evening because we have one of the most influential energy leaders in the entire country. Uh, but before we get to that, we do have a few logistics that we wanted to cover. First, can you please all turn off your cell phones? Second, we are going to have a Q&A after the discussion, so please hold your questions until then. Uh, when we do have the Q&A, this, this is being videotaped, so we ask that you please speak into the mic at the appropriate time. And also, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank a few people. As you can imagine, an event like this takes a lot of hard work, and we had a great team working on this. Uh, so first, I'd like to thank Amy Hornstein and Kate Blumberg from the program office, who without, this, uh, without them, this event wouldn't have happened. Lala Wu, for all of her advice and support, she's one of the Burke presidents, as she said, and we had a ton of Burke volunteers from across the campus. They're sitting mainly here, and I appreciate your help to Today and, and in the planning of this event. Also, Media Services, uh, who's videotaping, and also we are simulcasting this uh, next door. If you need to take a break, it's still going to be happening. Uh, Tatiana Aris, thank you for your help. And Jake Ziegelman, who, as manager of PG&E, works very closely with Mr. Darby and spent an incredible amount of time on this event. And again, it wouldn't have been possible without him. So thank you, Jake. And of course, Mr. Darby, who has been extremely generous with his time, both tonight and in the planning of this event. So please uh, join me in thanking all of them. And, and I know you guys are anxious to get on with the program, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, a, a little bit more about Bev Alexander. Bev is currently the director of the Clean Tech to Market program here at Haas, and has been involved in energy and environmental innovation for the, almost 30 years. Briefly, Clean Tech to Market is a program that brings graduate students and scientists together to commercialize clean energy inventions and to develop tomorrow's energy leaders. Students from business, law, policy, and engineering work with technologies which are drawn from the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and across UC Berkeley. Previ previously, as a senior vice president at PG&E, Bev was in charge of the largest energy efficiency, solar, and demand response programs in the United States. These programs moved more than $1.2 billion into the California economy and won over 75 awards, including the US Department of Energy's Energy Star Sustained Excellence Award. Bev also held director, chief counsel, and vice president positions at PG&E with a focus on leadership development and strategic planning. Before PG&E, Bev specialized in emerging environmental law and policy. In fact, the National Law Journal recognized her nationally as one of the top 40 attorneys under the age of 40 for her pioneering work. She received her BA in Environmental Studies from UC Santa Cruz and her JD from UC Berkeley Bolt right next door, where she was editor-in-chief of the Ecology Law Quarterly. So clearly, Bev loves all things energy, and we thank you for joining us tonight, Bev. Thank you so much, Joey. I'm going to stay seated because we're going to move straight from my introduction into the discussion. Um, we really appreciate, Joey did an enormous amount of work on this program, so thank you very much. Uh, we shared Peter's bio in the, in the invitation, so I'm gonna hit the highlights. Um, first of all, a little bit about PG&E Corporation. It is a $35 billion company, just a small company. <laughs> the holding company owns the largest gas and electric utility in the United States. 
serving 15 million customers. Uh, so Peter has his hands full. He uh, studied his academic background, economics from Dartmouth, MBA at Tuck, and nuclear, uh, some nuclear work at MIT because uh, we have a nuclear, I still say we, PG&E PG has a nuclear plant, so he has to know all about the nuclear side of the business. Um, he's been in a veteran of the banking, telecom, and energy industries, playing a number of roles during his career. Uh, first VP and co-head um, of the Goldman Sachs Energy and Telecommunications Group, then CFO and controller at uh, Pac Bell. Uh, through the early telecom revolution when cell phones were starting to come online. I know that sounds odd to those of you who can't imagine life without cell phones. Peter and I are dating our, you know, each, our age here. Um, and then moved uh, just as the firestorm of deregulation hit PG&E. Peter came in in 1999 as a senior vice president and CFO. And it wasn't Peter's fault, but all heck broke loose in the industry. Um, going through 10 of the roughest years that California has seen in energy, including deregulation, re-regulation, a, a supply crisis, um, recalling the California governor, um, a price crisis, and multiple bankruptcies. And Peter actually led and designed PG&E's financial recovery from that crisis and did an outstanding job of it. Um, he is now the award-winning president, um, president, CEO, and chairman of the board of PG&E focusing on environmental leadership, operational excellence, and customer service, and has just won so many awards for the work that he's done there. With a portfolio that includes 300 megawatts of energy efficiency and 7,000 uh, signed megawatts of renewables, equal to about 15 fossil fuel-fired plants, Peter has just won countless awards. I'm only going to read a couple of them here. The Global 100's most sustainable, he's on, pg and &E is on the Global 100's most sustainable corporations in the world list, CRO's 100 best corporate citizens list, Newsweek's uh, number one utility of the greenest big companies list, Platt's energy efficiency program of the year, and Fast Company named pg and &E, and I don't know that a utility's ever been on this list, uh, among the top 10 innovative companies alongside Apple and Google. So that's pretty remarkable for a chairman of a utility. Um, on a more personal note, that's a lot of the resume piece. Um, Peter's colleagues know him as fearless. Uh, that is probably my favorite word to describe Peter. He is literally willing to sail into hurricanes if he has to, and that's no joke. He's a sailor, he owns a boat, and he has sailed into hurricanes. Mm -hmm. But it's a great metaphor for the work that he has done in the revolutions through telecom and through energy. Uh, he loves to include students and recent graduates. We initially had this conversation just between Peter and I, and it was so much more symbolic of his leadership to include Joey in the conversation because that's what he does in the executive boardroom at PG&E is he brings in new hires and asks them their opinions about thing, things. Finally, Peter believes in doing what you believe in rather than what's easy, and that doesn't always guarantee popularity. Um, he, for his environmental policies, he's been labeled as impressive, progressive, and visionary. For some re recent work on a very controversial Prop 16 and some issues going on with meters, there's been a few less flattering adjectives floating around in the media. Uh, we're going to get into all of that tonight and allow Peter a chance to articulate his position on those. So again, we want to thank Peter. It's an extremely generous uh, gift of time. And Burke for sponsoring one word about Burke before we start the conversation. A recent uh, Clean Tech to Market supporter said, the key strength of Clean Tech to Market is access to Burke. We view that student body as a very promising talent pool for the clean tech industry, and I couldn't agree more. So it's very fitting tonight that we have a, a conversation between a top energy executive of today and the most promising energy leaders of tomorrow, and we're very excited about that. So without further introduction, uh, Peter, the, as we mentioned, over the last decade, you've led an industry through massive disruption. What are you, we'd like to hear your perspective on key trends and dynamics, and how do you respond to the stereotype that continues to linger that somehow utilities are easy, safe, and boring? Uh, you know, that you just sit there and earn a regulated rate of return. What about that? <laughs> well, uh, thank you first, Bev, uh, and thank you all for the opportunity to speak uh, with you, and I hope after that introduction that I can measure up to 25% of your expectations. So uh, I'll try my best. Uh, you know, I go different places around uh, the world and uh, the country, and 
hear from time to time, uh, you know, utilities, they get a guaranteed return. PG&E gets a guaranteed return, and, you know, anybody can run that place. And, <laughs> and so I said to myself, well, if that's the case, then why were both of California's utilities insolvent and in financial crisis just uh, less than 10 years ago? If it was so easy to run a utility and we have a guaranteed return, how is it that uh, we were in financial distress and couldn't raise any money and the lights were going off and it was a crisis for the state of California? So I said, well, you know, that's just one question that people ought to ask themselves. Uh, the second thing is, if you look at what's happening in our industry, it's very dynamic. Uh, as Bev mentioned, you know, there's been this move, deregulation, re-regulation, parts of the business are, are being deregulated while other parts are regulated. For example, generation has been largely deregulated. Customer choice provides opportunity for other companies to invade our business. I worked in bankruptcy, uh, workouts and bankruptcies in 1980 at Citicorp, and what I learned there was the most perilous time for a company is when government dramatically changes the rules. And then we saw what happened to Chrysler. We saw what happened to the railroads, the Penn Central Railroad, uh, the trucking industry. What you see is when government dramatically changes the rules, there's a tremendous scramble and that a lot of companies get left by the, the way. But on top of that, with respect to the energy business, what you see today is that there's the introduction of new technologies coming all the time. So you see the, the solar business, energy efficiency business, fuel cell business, and all of that. These are potentially, and I believe probably literally, disruptive technologies. So what I would argue, having been at Goldman Sachs and worked with those guys, having started out a commercial banker, been on the office of the chairman's staff at AT&T in my, in my 30s, was, is that, in fact, a scenario like this demands the most of management, and that if you don't have the management team to do it, you could be sunk. And so over the last five years, 40 of the officers at PG&E have been changed out, and new ones have come in. And the interesting ones that have come in are a South Korean immigrant dropped into the New York City school system at the age of 12 and couldn't speak English and graduated from Harvard Law School. He's a survivor. We have a woman whose family you know, were refugees from Cuba, and she wound up running Florida Power and Lights uh, operations as an MBA and a chemical engineer. So what we've done as a result of that is I've gone out together with my colleagues to try and hire the best and brightest. And part of that has been actually developing an MBA recruiting program so that we have an ongoing influx year over year are the best and brightest in America. So it's not so easy, I don't think. <laughs> it doesn't uh, sound so easy. I, there are a lot of challenges there, and we're going to talk about more of them tonight. Well, one of the areas that you've really distinguished yourself, one of many, is on climate change. You've, you've stepped out in front of the pack uh, to the dismay of some of your peers, literally walking out on the United States Chamber of Commerce because you disagreed with their policies. Uh, as a business leader, you're not, an, you're not an, running an environmental nonprofit. You're a business leader. How did you decide to make climate change one of your top priorities, and how did you reach the, the opinion that climate change was even real and, and needed your attention? Great. Good question. You know, I think in everything you do in, in business and in life, you really have to talk to your conscience. And so the, the question I had when I arrived on, July, on January 1st, 2005, into this nice big office that has a great view over, over the bay, is I thought about the awesome responsibility of running a company, actually with 45 billion in assets now, and 20,000 men and women serving 15 million. And so in my early survey of due diligence, learning and investigating what is it that I need to know and what are, what are the important things for me to deal with, and then the things that I can deal with later or not at all, the question of climate change came up. And the question of conscience that went through my mind was this. How could you feel, how would you feel, if you were running this huge company 
And it and other utilities in the world had a dramatically negative impact on this planet. Perhaps people's lives were destroyed because of it. People were injured. There were droughts, other things. How could you live with yourself if you, one, didn't look into the question and ask yourself, is this a problem or is it not? Is mankind impacting it? And let's say you did find the answers to that. How could you continue in your role uh, in good conscience and do that without doing everything you could do to deal with and limit and mitigate your company's impact on, uh, on the world? But then I asked the second question. I said, Peter, you are a CEO and you owe a fid uh, fiduciary obligation to your, your shareholders. So while there's an issue of personal conscience, you also have to ask the question about your role as CEO and make sure whatever you're doing is consistent with that. If you can't reconcile the two, maybe you should quit. And so what I asked myself was, so let's say our company and other utilities emit as much carbon as they can, regardless of what the answers to these questions are. Um, we go 20 years down the road, and somebody brings a lawsuit against the company, and I'm on the, uh, on the uh, stand testifying, and they say, did you look into this? And I say, well, maybe not. Did you know that it could have been a problem? Well, maybe yes. Did you do anything about it in reducing your company emissions? No, nah, well, you know, it was kind of legal and uh, to do it. Nobody said this was a problem at the time. I said to myself, that's a real problem, those series of uh, questions. So I said, one, I have a tremendous obligation, both individually as well as professionally, to get to the bottom of this important issue. Two. If it is an issue, then I have to do everything I can responsibly within the context of my role to reduce the carbon emissions of our company to minimize the impact on the planet. Thirdly, if I'm going to be sitting on that stand 20 years from now, I want our defense attorney to say, Mr. Darby, did you do anything else besides work to reduce the carbon emissions? And I said, I wanted to be able to be in a position where I said, not only did we reduce the emissions, but we learned as much as we could about this issue, and then we went out and tried to change an industry and people outside the industry to do the right thing. So that the defense attorney would say, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, if anybody should be sued, lastly, it's this company because they did everything they could diligently to deal with us. So having gone through that process, what we did was we called together the greatest scientists in the world on this issue. One of them is sitting here right now, Art Rosenfeld. And what we did was we put the top 15 people in our country, company together. And I said, in the spirit of direct and honest communication, like I'm speaking with you now, challenge these guys. Ask them the hard questions. Let's get to the bottom of it. And we did. And what we found was the case for climate change was overwhelmingly persuasive. And the case against climate change was, frankly, in my mind, almost laughably weak. And from that, we drew, drew the conclusion and made the declaration, the Earth is warming, mankind is responsible, and the need for action is now. And that has governed our strategic vision with respect to environmental policy and the operation of the company since then. Sorry for the long answer. No, it's a, good, no, it's a great good, answer. Great. Mr. Darby, though, uh, I read your paper on climate change, which was a part of the invitation that we sent out to everyone, and I'm convinced. Um, some of the people out there might not be convinced, and, and one of the arguments you make is uh, to implement these energy reduction strategies, it, it's minimal costs com uh, compared to the costs that are involved. Uh, if this is true, why aren't other companies in, on board like PG&E is? Well, Joey, uh, you're right that what the uh, Congressional Bud Budget Office concluded, and they're a nonpartisan, well-respected group, is that the impact on GNP of pursuing a, 
uh, cap and trade and moving us away from a heavily carbon-based economy is so small that what it will do by the year 2050 is it will set us back about six months on GNP. So in other words, we'll arrive uh, in December, uh, well, of January of 2050 at a point in GNP where we would have otherwise been uh, in June. So, you know, in the big, big uh, scale of things, not that much of a difference. It's, it's manageable. Um, why other companies don't uh, feel the same way? The first thing I've discovered about companies is they love to moan. And they love to say, oh, it's going to be horrible if we have this change. And we can't do it, and we can't survive, and we can't thrive. And companies tend to regularly overstate that issue. And there were many people at PG&E who said when decoupling w was introduced 30 years ago, oh my God, we can't run the company, it'll bring us down. But you know, one thing about American business, and I think business generally, but most in America, is people are incredibly innovative and creative, and they find ways to adapt. So I think what happens is, uh, you know, everybody really kind of overreacts to this and, and creates a boogeyman about it. There are, there are people whose oxes will be gored. I mean, the oil companies, it would create stress for the auto companies. Uh, but we do have a problem, unfortunately, in America, which is bigger than that. And that is that this issue has become so politicized that you can't have a discussion about it. And I find in my own family, when I go back to the East Coast, we can't have a conversation about it. <laughs> And, you know, that's really unfortunate. And what's happened in my family is true of America, the larger American family. We can't have a rational discussion and respectful and civil discourse about this topic and many others. Instead, what has happened is the country has moved to being polarized, and people are throwing rocks from the far right and the far left. And, you know, I've never known anything good to be accomplished when people are screaming at each other, calling them names, and have closed off the ability to listen. And that's what we have to do with America if we're not going to lose our great position in the world. And so, you know, one thing I just encourage all of you young people that are here today is, is really work on kind of trying to listen and understand other people's point of view. You know, and even if they're saying they don't believe in climate change, Understanding why that, they feel that way might give you insight as to what might be the key to open up their mind. Because unfortunately, this is, as Dick Meserve, the chairman of the Carnegie Institution, a leading Republican, former chair of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, a guy who by his political beliefs should not believe in climate change based on being one of a great scientist and a head of a, a, of a research organization, his people are working on climate change every day, and he describes it as the greatest challenge mankind has ever faced. Clearly, the direction that the industry is headed is going to call for a significant amount of innovation. Right. And I know you feel very strongly about culture and cultural transformation. Historically, the view of utilities and their regulators is that they tend to be fairly risk averse and that you've been actively working to change that culture at PG&E. Can you tell us how you're sh what you are personally doing to shift the culture and also how, how are utilities going to embrace new technologies when they don't have a 20-year history on them? I mean, no normally utilities want a 20-year history on everything. Near and dear to the heart of anybody in clean tech to market is this question of there's going to be innovation. How do we actually get these new things into the utility? So you, both your personal view and your sense of the industry. Well, if you envision utilities having been very conservatively run and prone to not changing as opposed to changing, and then you have the environment that I just described, the business environment, which is very dynamic, and regulation is changing, and technology is changing. What you could conclude was the biggest risk you face is not changing rapidly enough. So if you're really working from risk aversion, what you realize is in the short term, you have to become less 
risk averse. You have to change more rapidly. So, so that, as you think about it, that's something to go through. The, the, the other thing is, utilities tend to be, suffer from, I think it's called the Stockholm Syndrome, <laughs> where you sort of become, the, the prisoner, you know, sort of becomes, uh, you know, uh, alike with the captor. And utilities reflect and react to their commissions. And so if you have a, a commission that constantly punishes innovation and failure in a big way, then you're not gonna have change. Now, fortunately today, and, and for the last several years, uh, we've had uh, President Michael Peavy in, uh, uh, commissioner as, at the CPUC. We have Tim Simon here tonight. Uh, and, and there's been a view that the world is rapidly changing and we need to adjust. And so our commission has been open to change and promoted change uh, with us. So I think fundamentally you have to develop a point of view. Do you have a bias for change or a bias for not changing? Given that thought process that we went through, we have a bias for change. Then the next thing is how do you create innovation? Well, the first thing I have to say is that an organization is the shadow of its leader, without question. And probably also the leaders that came before. So it's changing you know, as a result of these leaders. So it's critically important that the CEO set the tone with respect to risk and innovation. And so what I try and do is I, I come from a point of view that the people that have the best ideas about how to run the company better are the people closest to the work, the youngest and most junior people. And so you need to stimulate an environment where you're constantly trying to encourage them to give good ideas about how to run the business. So today, when we're in a meeting at PG&E, I turn to the most junior person and say, what do you think? And boy, I tell you, that scares them the first couple of times. <laughs> You know, in the old days, as Bev can relate, I mean, if you talked up at a meeting with the CEO there in the first three or four years of your career, it's like, you know, <laughs> it's over. So first thing is to create that environment. The second is to create an environment for, you know, trial and, and looking into things. So we, we had an opportunity to invest in uh, solar and space. And a lot of people in our company said, well, why the heck are you gonna do that? And we talked to all the incumbents like Boeing and all, and they said, it'll never work. My people came back to me and said, it'll never work. And I said, the incumbents have always said new disruptive technology will never work. So why are we listening to Boeing? What, what we said was, I said, you're uncomfortable whether the technology is gonna work. And they said, yes. I said, let's structure the deal so they bear the risk of technology and their venture capitalists do, and we don't. And they said, well, how are we gonna do that? So we're only gonna pay for the power if it's delivered. So they go, oh, I guess that makes sense. And, then, the, this, and then, then we put it back to the company and said, hey, it's up to you and your venture capitalists. You ready to take on the risk? We're not gonna take the technology risk. We'll, we'll take the market risk for you. Will you do that? And they said, we will. Second thing was the, the risk about the electromagnetic waves, the microwaves, and might we injure people? And so I said, well, their government has a big role to play. It's really government's role. So let's ensure as they go along that they're constantly um, abiding by the rules of government, that they are getting their plans reviewed. And let's look to government for that rather than take on that risk. So the two principal objectives or objections that people had uh, went away. And so I said, okay, now are we at a risk level where we can accept it? He said, yes. I said, we need to do this because if we can get solar power from space on a practical basis, that's a huge breakthrough because you get that solar power seven by 24 with no clouds, okay? So it's vastly superior to the solar we have even in the Mojave Desert. So I said, this will be a big breakthrough for the company and society. So if we can find a way to do it, we need to do it. And we did. So we signed that contract and we're working with them and hope they deliver. I hope they deliver too. Okay. <laughs> it would be very exciting. Um, so, yeah, go ahead. Do you want to ask about technology? Well, sure. So um, <coughs> uh, solar space would be awesome. And we know there's a, there's a lot of other technologies that you're working with. You've got a, a very robust energy efficiency program that has an emerging technology piece of it. I see Jonathan up here. Um, 
uh, there's an electric car piece. You've got all these 7,000 megawatts of renewables under contract. Nuclear. Talk to us about the most important technologies that you see playing a role going forward. And if I can wrap in another element, are there choke points, like points on the grid that need to be addressed to, to keep all this moving along? So what's your technology view going forward? You know, I've looked at this issue as long ago as uh, now four years with uh, Jeff Immelt in the pit at uh, GE in uh, Crotonville, uh, that's what they call it. Uh, and they had all of the industry CEOs there uh, with GE having a dialogue on uh, climate change and the challenges and did electronic voting when we were there. It was a brilliant move on the part of GE uh, for their own self-interest because they got all of the views of the industry immediately and they were recorded electronically and in their database. Uh, so, you know, it was great being invited there, but it did a lot for them, free research. Uh, so, um, what came out of that was a conclusion. If we're going to deal with the, the challenge of carbon, we need all of the tools in the arsenal. So, we're going to need nuclear, we're going to need renewables, the first fuel should always be energy efficiency because it is the least expensive and it emits the least carbon. Uh, we're going to need demand management. Uh, we're going to need carbon capture and storage. We're going to need a portfolio. What I concluded coming out of that was I said, I don't know which is the winning technology. And I think that's where the other CEOs were too. And so the view, I, I thought of it a little bit like a roulette table we need to put our chips on multiple squares because we can't be sure that one or the other will be the winning technology. We need to work across that, that whole spectrum. And in fact, the industry has picked that up and there is in fact uh, uh, what is called the wedge in a spectrum, which some of you are familiar with, that outlines how much we need from each. And what is scary is we need a lot from each. Uh, and to meet our demands by 2050. Uh, so we're, we're going to need each of those uh, technologies from energy efficiency uh, to solar. And on solar, uh, or excuse me, renewable, that can be solar, that can be wind, that can be wave, uh, we don't know. We're gonna need nuclear. And I'll tell you, I know a lot of people, particularly in Berkeley, aren't keen on nuclear. And I'm not prepared to start a new nuclear plant here in California right now because we're doing enough with renewables. But what I will say is for America in places like uh, Georgia and Alabama and Mississippi, I think it would be good for us to use nuclear. Uh, and that the storage problem I see is far less significant compared to the challenge of climate change. And in fact, I've worked with the people at uh, Lawrence Livermore Labs and they're working on fusion. And if they can deliver on fusion the way they'd like to, one possibility is that we could burn the, the uh, fissionable material that is the waste disposal today, we could burn that to, in fact, turbocharge that fusion reaction. So I believe we'll come up with solutions, but we need all of the solutions right now, and we need to be moving uh, on all fronts accordingly. So, so one of the technologies you guys are working on uh, is the so-called smart meters. And uh, I saw you speak at the CPUC, it was a great talk, and there were protesters out front who were calling these smart meters dumb meters. And uh, if you could, I, I understand you guys had some backlash, uh, and, and if you could just discuss this whole issue, uh, are they smart, are they dumb, are they somewhere in between, and, and where are we going from here? Yeah, uh, you know, this has been an education for everyone to observe, and you've been able to get the education without much pain. I've been able to get the education with tremendous amounts of pain. And uh, believe me, I mean, everywhere I go, you know, we get drilled on smart meters. So let, let me give you the facts. Uh, in California, uh, there has been a tier system of rates. And uh, the average rate today is 15 cents and the top tier is 50 cents. And the tiers depend on how much power you use. And if you look at your bill, you can kind of work through this. Originally, the tier system wasn't so steep, but in connection with the energy crisis, there was a freeze put in on tiers one and two as part of a political deal. And what has happened in the last 10 years is all of the reasonable rate increases of three or 4% per year have been amplified into tiers three, four, and five, and so the top tier has moved to 50 cents a tier, so three times the average rate in California. 
So you take that phenomenon, and then you take a look at what happened a year ago in Bakersfield. In Bakersfield, uh, a year last year, they had 17 days over 100 degrees. The previous year, there were six days over 100 degrees, and I'm talking about during the month of July. So it was almost three times as hot as you measure it. Well, what happened was people who were in you know, the lower tiers got rocketed into the high tiers. So a bill, we looked at the you know, degree days and all, a bill that ran generally like 200 bucks a month, could, we could explain exactly how that bill could be $800 a month in that July. Well, for most of us, you know, if you're used to paying a $200 bill and all of a sudden you get $800, you say, something's broken here, it's not working. What happened is there were some people who didn't have smart meters, and they ran in and said, we've heard about smart meters, and it must be those smart meters that explain the problem. And we went out and looked, and they had an old meter. Many of the people had had smart meters for a year and never had a problem until they ran into that July. Unfortunately, there was a political figure that saw that has kind of pattern of taking advantage of situations like this, so they threw hearings where they said, pg and &E, come in and explain what happened. And our guys got like two or three minutes. And then they said, okay, we got a lot of angry people in the back, who by the way had very little facts and information. We wanna hear from them. So the whole event was about, you know, how angry people were and what a villain pg and &E was. And interestingly, you know, this outcome was an inadvertent step of government, where government froze tiers one and two and never thought about oh, what are the implications of that going to be 10 years from now? And it was a nightmare. So uh, we've had a big problem. Uh, we did an independent uh, look, and we'll have to see how the independent review done by the commission, the Public Utilities Commission, has uh, what it comes up with. It's going to be out Friday, I believe. Uh, but what our assessment showed was that two-tenths of 1% of the meters were faulty and had a problem. Two-tenths of 1% of the meters were faulty. I've gone and talked to all sorts of technology companies, and they have said, if we could have a result like that, we would be thrilled. Just think of your experiences with cell phones and other things, and computers. So as we've gotten into it, there is not a technology problem with respect to uh, the um, uh, chips and the devices and the meters themselves. Now, on another, I think it's six or eight tenths of a percent, our guys installed them incorrectly, trampled over the shrubs, got complaints, uh, were rude. And I ask you, for those of you who have done, dealt with contra contractors at home, if you had a problem 1% of the time with a contractor, would that be a good experience or bad? I feel if I go 50-50, I'm doing pretty well in, in my experience. <laughs> so I think, you know, we could have made, you know, done things differently. Now there's another issue called RF. Well, you know, I was on the office of the chairman staff at AT&T when we introduced um, cellular phones, and I took, like, over 10 years, many cell, companies, cell phone companies public. So I said, let's do a little analysis with our staff. I said, How, what's the wattage on a cell phone? one watt. What's the wattage on our meters? One watt. You hold a cell phone here, a meter is probably 10 to 20 feet away, behind a couple of walls, outside. Uh, so it's probably a lot less um, coverage in terms of electromagnetic emissions. And then I said, so how much do people use cell phones a day? And I think the answer for you guys is large. Uh, but, you know, many people have them right next to their ear. I, I said, let's be ridiculously conservative, 10 minutes a day. So what we did was we chose some assumptions and we said, okay, one watt, one watt, equal power. Uh, the cell phone's here. The meter is, we'll say, only 10 feet away. And we'll say there are no barriers, walls, between the meter and you. The meter, it turns out, emits... 45 seconds a day. And we'll say conservatively, the cell phone is being used 10 minutes a day. Now, how many of you use your cell phone or device 10 minutes a day? 
you would have to be in that house with that meter for 13,000 years in order to get the same electromagnetic exposure, emission exposure, as a cell phone for one year. So, in other words, there are many things in life to worry about, but the RF from smart meters is not one of them. <laughs> what I will say is PG&E could have done better in communications. We were the first, we were pioneers, and pioneers kind of run into challenges that, that the people who come second and third don't always run into. And so what we found was that we needed to explain the benefits better of our meters and inform and tell people about them. And we made a mistake. When we started working on them in 2002 and 2003, we kind of assumed that they were infrastructure. We didn't think many people gave a lot of thought to the meter hanging on the side of their house. And so we sort of assumed the same. And what we found was we were sadly wrong. And so the people who come behind us, we're spending $20 million and received authorization, I think, for $20 million from the CPUC on education on the um, smart meters. The people behind us, like Edison, are spending $100 million to educate people on them, and other companies are as well. And so, you know, those are some of the learnings that come with pioneering. And uh, sometimes you take a lot more shots as a pioneer than you do as second or third. So that's been our journey, and I've learned a lot on it, and uh, it's been tough. Well, we're glad you're still pioneering. <laughs> that's, that's where the fearless comes in handy, the hurricanes. So, um, One of the things in California that we're proud of, but it gets complicated, is it's a very activist state in terms of energy policies. And so we have um, all kinds of energy policies, and PG&E and PG has different positions on them. So, for example, you, I believe, recently came out in strong support of the aggressive climate change legislation, AB 32. Uh, pg and for decades advocated decoupling, even though we fought it when it first came out back. Ralph Cavana still reminds me of that. Um, but now advocates it, uh, even though much of the, the country doesn't, it's well understood and well accepted in California. pg and used to support shareholder incentives for energy efficiency, but no longer likes them, prefers more just the straight um, standards there. And California has one of the most aggressive renewable portfolio standards around at 33%. Clearly, this is a complicated area. When you couple that with the national agenda, which Joey's going to talk about, you have the potential for these um, multiple, potentially conflicting, overlapping mandates and, and requirements on utilities. So what's your take on this whole policy landscape? What do you, you're, there's, it's one thing to say something in the legislature, it's another thing to run a company around it. So you're out there trying to actually make this stuff work in practice. As a business person doing this day in and day out, what do you think works? And, and what's your take on why you're taking the positions that you are? You know, I, I've been doing a lot of thinking, uh, deep thinking about climate change. And a lot of thinking about the public and where is the public on climate change. And I think most people at the heart, they either believe in climate change or they have concerns that climate change may happen. But they're not convinced. Some people are not convinced. And so they don't want to pay a lot. And they don't want to uh, incur a slowdown in the economy because of implementing, let's say, a cap and trade bill or renewable policies and things like that. So as we've thought as a team about climate change and the role we play, we've, we've carved out a position, and that is that we need to continue the battle on climate change. But at the same time, we have to be very sensitive to the cost considerations, particularly in this economy, for our customers. And therefore, argue at every turn, we need to find the most cost-effective solutions to combating climate change. And if you choose that position, it's really the strategic high ground around this issue. And so one of the things that says is energy efficiency, energy efficiency. Absolutely, it's a no-brainer. It pays for itself. It's a great idea. As that has translated into legislation, we are working with the CARB on the implementation of AB 32, Assembly Bill 32, which would envision a cap-and-trade bill being put in place. And what we've said is, 
we need to have uh, an abundant um, uh, set of allowances. So people initially receive allowances, the companies, and they have time to transition to the new cleaner technologies. And for utilities, the benefit of those allowances that would go to the utilities, the benefits would be passed through immediately and completely to the customers. So if there was additional cost, but allowances offset those costs, those benefits would come to customers. Second thing is that there would be an abundant set of offsets, which are cheaper ways that people can buy offsets which reduce carbon and may be less expensive than if they were to reduce their carbon emissions themselves. And the third thing coming out of the energy crisis is we said we can't be sure that our model and our legislation will work. So we need a cost collar. So if this mechanism, like during the energy crisis, the model doesn't work as economists suggest, then what we need to do is have guardrails uh, <laughs> where there, there's a cap on carbon and it trades between a bottom of $10 and a top of $30 um, over a period of time, and then that margin expands. So that's one thing, and we're working with the CARB very hard and are a big ally in working to make sure that Assembly Bill 32 gets implemented. On the other hand, we had been out on Senate Bill 70, 722, which is the legislation that would move us to 33%. And what we've taken thus far now is it's an opposed but amended uh, unless amended position. And that is that a lot of people are getting in on this and changing it from a climate bill to their own economic agenda. And so, for example, people are saying, well, you know, 75% of the renewables have to come from California. Well, climate change is a planetary issue. And if every state starts to game the system to help them, the overall cost of fighting climate change goes up astronomically, creates the balkanization around this issue. So we should be reducing barriers rather than increasing. So we've come out and we've opposed, as has the governor, uh, AB, uh, Senate Bill 722 on renewables on the 33, because it's not a cost-effective and practical way to implement it. And the argument that I have made is, believe me, I'm all for climate change. But if we do it in a very expensive way, the people of California are going to revolt, and then it's going to set back this effort tremendously. And what we're trying to do now in California is create a model for the United States and the world after Washington failed in putting through federal legislation. So it's even more important that we get this model right and if we implement the model without adequate consideration to cost to consumers, we're going to set back this effort incredibly. And so that's the thought process that we've had, Bev. Great. Thank you. So, Mr. Robbie, I have a ton of other questions to ask you, but I do want to open it up to the audience to, uh, to have a chance. But before I let you do that, um, I, I wanted to ask you, you had an anecdote about how you taught your kids about energy efficiency. Uh, so if you could share that and then also, we have a lot of future, hopefully, energy leaders in this audience. What advice do you have for them when they get out of school to, uh, to help combat this climate change that you've been discussing? Well, on, on the first one, I, I introduced, you know, I was working with our kids, and kids are like, our kids used to be like most kids, and um, they um, would leave the television on, the stereo on, the lights on, fans going and all of that, and they do that to every room that they went through. And, you know, basically my wife would say, I'm tired of yelling at you guys about this and all, and I said, honey, let's, let's be smart, let's not, you know, get upset. And so we instituted a policy that, uh, and, and we didn't give our kids money, they had to make, earn money in our family. And, and um, the policy was, if you leave the lights on and the stereo going and all of that and you're not in the room, um, 25 cents. So I would just sit there and, you know, <laughs> I go, 25 cents, 25 cents, 25 cents. And as they got older, that 25 cents went to a dollar. It went 25, 50, 75, and then that. And you know what? We have three kids who are very concerned about the environment. Uh, they, they are very concerned about keeping the lights off, and it's worked marvelously well. They, 
they, when they see the politicians in California and all of that, when, when people are saying, you know, we don't believe in climate change and all that, they are even more ardent and emotional than I am. And they have good reason to be, because I'm gonna be out of here, you know. Uh, I will have passed away and, and you all and they will be in this world. And the challenge of climate change is gonna fall even more greatly on you and your children. And you need to decide what kind of world we want. So on the advice thing, the last one, I, I was asked this question and once before and this, this answer worked pretty well. So for all of you, I was asked this question, so you know, what's your advice as we're you know, leaving school and heading out in our careers? And I said, uh, write your obituary. And they went, what? I said, well, you can make it your eulogy. They went, what? <laughs> and, and I said, you know, when I started out in, in business and planning, the way you did it was you sort of looked at where you were and kind of took a ruler and extrapolated, you know, up 3% or 7% or 10%. And that's how you did planning. You know, you kind of looked at the curve and said, does it look pretty good, you know, and could we do that? And you started from where you were, looked at where you'd been, and kind of moved out the curve, and that, that was it. But 16 years ago, I started my study of leadership. And in that, I learned that that's not the way you create transformational change. The way you create transformational change is you put a stake in the ground in the future of a very attractive and desirable future, something that's audacious that you have no idea about how you're going to get there, like being the CEO of PG&E. I had no idea how I was going to get here or even where here was, but I knew I wanted it. And so I put it out there. And then you plan from the future back to the present. So you have a choice. You have a choice, you know, in that eulogy, do they say, you know, take it the son or the daughter, well, my dad or my mom, you know, but I've heard this accusation of a lot of dads, so I'm gonna blame it on them. So, you know, he was pretty successful. And he made a lot of money. And he got a big title, but I never saw him, and he was never there for me. Or talk to your neighbors. They can say, well, not very nice person, you know, very well known in their career, uh, but hardly saw him, couldn't care less about us, was kind of rude on the, on the road, you know, driving by us. Uh, or um, your church or your charity. Well, we see him, doesn't really give much to us, probably got a lot of money he could give us, but doesn't do much for us. Or your choice can be, oh, the last one. You know, and I've always had trouble getting comfortable with that trophy wife. <laughs> so so the, uh, the alternative is, you know, the, the man or the woman is a person of integrity, they did well because they understood that it was about we and not about me. They rose up in their career, they worked hard, but they were there for their children, they were there for their significant other, they had integrity, they were a good neighbor, they gave to their charities. They were not like the person that professor envisioned, which is your job is to make as much money as possible. They asked themselves, how can I be a responsible person, make a difference in the world, and make a difference for the better? So the choice is yours. The choice is for each one of you. And the time to think about it is now. Figure out what you want that obituary or eulogy to say. What do you want your son or daughter to say about you? Believe me, I have been to the funerals where the guy said, well, you know, my dad was kind of well-known and liked by many people, but he wasn't there for me. That's what his only son said. And so you have the choices to make, but you're not gonna wake up one day 30 years from now and, and it will have happened. The only way your future will be the way you want it is because you figured it out now and you made it the way you want it. 
because life has so many forces that pulls you in so many different directions. Unless you press back against those pressures, you're not going to wind up where you want to. Thank you. That's, that's good advice. Uh, we are going to open it up to the audience. We have two mic runners who are going to uh, run to <laughs> two people who are holding their hands up. So we'll start over there. Um, please keep your questions succinct and uh, in the form of a question. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, please. No statements Steve. allowed. <laughs> Hi, can you, it, there's a click on the bottom. Sounds live. Um, thanks for coming to talk of all, uh, uh, to all of us. Um, you mentioned disruptive technologies um, and mentioned things like solar and wind. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about shale gas and um, what effect that's had on both PG&E utilities in general in the U.S. and whether or not you think that's going to be a barrier to some of those other um, cleaner technologies, uh, both short-term and long-term. Right. So, you know, sometime back, uh, natural gas was up at $12 a, a million BTU. Uh, and um, the, um, so people were very concerned about a shortage. And then with those high prices, what came out were new technologies and really technologies that have been identified, but you know, were really turbocharged by that. And, and uh, shale gas was one. Uh, and the supply of natural gas in the United States, uh, some reports say we have enough here for, to fuel us for 100 years. Uh, there's a concern I have about uh, uh, shale gas, and that is it entails fracturing uh, and using large quantities of water and potentially um, doing things to that water which environmentally uh, raise concern. So I see on the one hand that we may have a very large increase in natural gas, but on the other, there may be pushback on the issue of this fracturing technology, which is essential for uh, the horizontal drilling and shale gas. Um, the effects in terms of the power supplies are the following. That um, shale uh, gas has now gotten to the point where it's almost as cheap or cheaper than coal. And so with that low price of natural gas, we can see a lot of shift from coal burning over to natural gas. And natural gas emits about half the carbon of coal. And so that would be very positive in the near term. <coughs> I, I don't think we have enough in terms of renewables and nuclear and all that that um, uh, we can immediately go from coal to all of these uh, carbon-free solutions. And so inexpensive gas is helpful and an enabler in shifting towards a less carbon-intense environment. So I think that's positive. A negative associated with it is when natural gas prices were high, the spread between renewable costs and natural gas, the alternative at the margin, was per narrower. And therefore, the incremental cost of renewables wasn't so great. Uh, and now that gap has opened up. And so some people, as they do their calculations, say it's real expensive to go to renewables. And so that could be an inhibiting factor. I think on balance, probably in the short term, if we can get enough transition from coal to natural gas, it will be beneficiary, be beneficial but we should view it as an intermediate step towards a carbon-free environment. Thank you. We have a question over here. There you go. Is it on now? Okay, yeah. great. All right, so Peter, I've got a question which I was hoping to get your, it's a hypothetical question, get your sort of executive gut reaction on. So the hypothetical question is we get carbon markets here, maybe in the United States, maybe just in California, um, but the price of that carbon market is still not enough to close that gap between, say, building a natural gas plant and building a solar plant. How would you feel, sort of, as PG&E's strategy, um, you know, if it was cheaper to just continue building natural gas or whatever the, the best we could come up with and paying that fee or possibly buying offsets across the world, would you feel comfortable pursuing a strategy like that, or do you feel that it's an integral part of the utility business to develop renewable energy here in California or throughout the West as a direct sort of connection to our grid? The, the great merit of a cap and trade program is it's supposed to be the most efficient way to uh, get to a, a 
lower carbon emissions. And so um, I've always felt that uh, a renewable strategy is kind of rough justice in that it's a command and control approach where the embedded cost of carbon is between $100 and $300 a ton, as opposed to the range that most experts feel carbon will trade at in a cap and trade program, which is between 10 and 30 or $40 a ton in the near term. So I would be, feel very good if that caused us to shift over. There are a couple of issues to be considered. One is, in, in Europe, they found that, frankly, they implemented the cap and trade program badly. They issued too many allowances. What happened initially is the price of carbon went way up and then it came down. But the reason was that they hadn't done a good carbon inventory. Also, using the uh, cost collar, which PG&E initiated the, the thinking on that in 2006, we would have a Fed-like institution in buying allowances to ensure that the price would go between the floor of 10 and remain in the range below $30. Um, also, in addition to that, I feel I'm a believer in offsets so long as they are real, verifiable, measurable, incremental, and there are a couple of other criteria so that they're really adding value. So uh, the whole idea of a cap and trade program is if offsets are available and other people can reduce the carbon emissions more cheaply than you can, that's great. That's great. That's the right solution. So, so long as the cap and trade program were working right, I would be comfortable with moving away from the mandates of you must do um, you know, renewables and they have to look like this because it's not consistent with PG&E's position of progress on climate change but the least cost solutions. That's Any why I'm such a believer in energy efficiency. So we have one over there, Stephen, and we have one over here. Thanks. Um, so I'm not completely up to date on the, uh, the kind of the progress of nuclear plants, but last I had checked, uh, none of them had the kind of final operating um, authorization to go ahead and build the actual plants, and there are a number that are, um, I think, in early stages. What, what's your view on what the timeline's actually gonna be for these being built, given the low gas price environment, maybe hostile regulators and whatnot? Okay, so um, the, the leading plants in that regard, uh, and there's what is called now a combined operating and um, it's a COL um, permit. The purpose of that is to accelerate the movement but I think what we're looking at, and I forget whether it's Southern, I think Southern's in there and the Progress Company um, for another reactor. We're still looking at development phases which are 10, 12, and 15 years, uh, and that's too long. Now you might say, wow, why would anybody pursue nuclear with development of 10, um, 10 and 15 years? The reality is the permitting process in California for renewables can be up to nine years, we have examples of that. So one of the points that I've raised with President Obama, Stephen Chu, the governor, the commission, is we got a real problem in this country with the gridlock of regulations and EPA and all of that where we can't get anything done. We can't even create more renewable energy because of the, the um, gauntlet of federal, state, and local agencies uh, that have created an impossible grid to get through. And so what PG&E is working on right now is a presentation, which I've seen, um, which follows the case studies that show the horror stories of taking seven and nine years you know, to develop renewable resources. And what it does is it looks at all of the different people we've contracted with, all of the obstacles and barriers, and the fact that there's no coordination across the federal, state, and local um, agencies for approvals, indicating that it may take forever to get these things built. And so with our analysis, we're using production line techniques to analyze this. But basically, I think if, if the United States is going to get where it needs to be on energy, we need to use manufacturing-like techniques to look at start, finish, and have standards in place for each of the agencies as to when they have to review these things and deliver. Then uh, we need to also fund these agencies so they have the resources 
to actually do the job. So it's a little bit like some of the work I did in new product development in the former life. And uh, we straightened out all of that mess and we went from producing three new products a year to 33 new products a year. And that's the same kind of thing we have to do with agency and permit approvals. Alden. Thanks, Thanks very much for your time tonight. Um, you mentioned the difficulty in predicting what technologies will be successful going into the future. Could you nevertheless speculate, um, given what you know now and what you're thinking about for the future, what PG&E's uh, power generation mix might look like in 2030? Um, <laughs> you know, I, I'll be candid. I don't have a good feel for what uh, the portfolio will look like in 2030. Um, we will be, we're working towards the 33 renewable, 33 percent renewables. Today, we have about half of our um, power comes from carbon-free uh, generation. We have 2,200 megawatts out of our Diablo uh, power plant. We have uh, twice that in the largest investor-owned hydro system in the country. And then we have the renewables, which today are about 18%. So I think we'll, we'll have moved the 18 to 33 by that time. Uh, Diablo hopefully will be relicensed. I would hope that we'd have a lot of the hydro. Uh, so uh, I think it will look like that. We, we have a fair amount of wind now. The problem with wind is it's very intermittent. Solar, at least, the power is there uh, when you most need it because it's hottest. So we will proportionately go into solar. We're looking at wave action and tidal. Uh, and I like tidal, for example, because, you know, if it's in San Francisco or some other place like that, you can depend on it uh, day in, day out, which is really great. So um, beyond that, then I think there are going to be new additions. I don't think, um, I doubt whether we would do more nuclear fission, and I think it would be too early for us to have anything on fusion probably at that point. But there probably will be a wild card in there. Uh, a one certainly to look at would be Bloom Technology. Uh, and uh, their fuel cells. The key is they have to be able to bring their prices down. We're doing a pilot with uh, their technology now. So I, I, th you know, I expect that there'll be one or two disruptive technologies there. Just, you know, it always happens. So that, that, that's about the best I can do. Thanks again for being here tonight. We really appreciate it. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the Prop 16 experience and what you took away from that over the last year or so. Yeah, on uh, Prop 16, let me, um, let me tell you the thinking. Some people have said, like, what were they thinking? Were they mad? And, you know, this, this didn't really, our, our thinking on it really didn't come out. So what happened on Prop 16 is um, we had had a history of cases where uh, civil servants decided they wanted to take over our business in places like Sacramento, San Francisco, uh, uh, South San Joaquin. Um, and... In the end, the people in those uh, cities voted against the civil servants. It started out in uh, Sacramento that it was 52-48. I think uh, the last vote in um, San Francisco was totally lopsided, and they do this repeatedly in San Francisco about every three to five years. And so basically, these were costing us on the order of about $15 million a shot to defend against these efforts. And so what happened was, um, one of our people came to me and said, we have an idea about how we might reduce this phenomenon. It wasn't people um, creating municipalization efforts where they want to. It was creating municipalization efforts where civil servants who didn't have the vote of the people, like a board of supervisors, say, yeah, this is a good idea, let's do it. Just because they want to expand government. And I go like, so government has run government so well, now they want to get into a new business. So, so um, uh, what happened was we said, what we could do here is uh, we require a vote. Now, frankly, a lot of people don't realize that in order for a municipal um, to take us over, they think a vote would be required of the people. It's not required. And I think that people ought to, on a major decision of getting into a new business on something that can cost hundreds of millions of dollars, people ought to have a vote. Uh, the, um, 
Now, what we did was we said, okay, what are the existing laws in place if we wanted to take over a municipality's business? It would require a vote, and it would require a two-thirds vote. So we said, well, if it's good for the goose, shouldn't it be good for the gander? Shouldn't we have a two-thirds vote? And uh, you know, we got clobbered with that. I think if we had said 50%, people would have you know, sort of looked into it. But the problem was we never had an opportunity to have a discussion. Like most people felt they already had a right to vote on it where they don't. And so we got into a situation of sound bites, which is how these things, you know, when I talk to our experts, they say, hey, you know, you're not going to have an opportunity to talk with people and explain all of this. You got a 30 second sound bite. So it's like big government hasn't done well, so do we want more of it and do we want them taking over power? That was our argument. And their, their argument was, it's a monopoly protecting its monopoly. And unfortunately, we didn't have one of those good informed discussions. Because I think if people realize that, they go, huh, you mean government can take you over uh, with no vote, and, does, and you're saying two thirds, because that's what's required for a bond measure, or that's what's required for major investment. Yeah, you know, the same hurdle might make sense. So anyway, uh, we got into it. The vote was 52-48. Uh, we lost it. Um, what I learned from that all, also was that um, the heat on that created you know, a lot of animosity, that those people that weren't inclined to like us uh, liked us a lot less from that. And uh, those people that liked us still said, we like it, and we voted that way. So, um, you know, it's not something I'm prepared to do next year. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't think I'll ever do it again as a CEO, but it was kind of painful and difficult. Uh, but I think, you know, there are a lot of politicians who would have said if you just put 50% in there rather than two-thirds, we would have thought that that was a good idea. So maybe that was a, you know, an, a place where we made an error. If technology makes it so that distributed generation and microgrids are the lowest cost way to deliver energy to customers, how will PG&E stay relevant? How will we stay relevant? Yeah, to your customers. Yeah, um, you may have noticed that PG&E has made two investments, one in the fastest growing uh, solar rooftop company uh, in, um, uh, in the, probably in the United States called Solar City. You hear them on the radio all the time. We made another investment in solar uh, sun power. And uh, I think we're going to make some more investments that you're going to hear about. So what we found with most of these uh, is that they, they need the grid. They're not totally self-sufficient in an island. And so what I have discussed with some policymakers is um, policymakers need to be careful not to create an economic model that undermines utilities if you, utilities are still vital for the state. And so we should consider moving to a, a different model, which is similar to the wholesale model, which is that you are charged monthly a charge for the amount of power that you would like to demand if you need it from the system, and you're also charged for the amount of power that you actually use, which is the way the wholesale market works. And so, for example, if you take Tony's Fine Foods in Sacramento, they're a three megawatt customer. We have to build new uh, power plants for them, transmission and distribution for those three megawatts. But they have solar rooftops, and they're only paying us for one and a half megawatts. And so that doesn't really work. Uh, so that's, that's an issue on distributed generation. Now, in your question, were you focused just on micro turbines? Did you raise the question of micro turbines? Microgrids. Microgrids. Okay, so if a microgrid can be self, uh, self uh, or independent with no claim on the larger grid, uh, then there's question as to should there be any charges there. To date, most of them are intermittent by nature, and so they really have a dependency on the grid. And therefore, in our estimation, people ought to pay for that. There's a societal cost. There ought to be a societal payment. So unfortunately, <coughs> we are out of time. I'm sure there are a lot of 
questions that you'd like to ask Mr. Darby, but I want to give him the last word. And before I do, if you could all please join me in thanking him for being so generous with his time tonight. <laughs> Well, just let me say uh, thank you. Um, the, the reason, part of the um, strategy, I, I was coming home from the Carnegie Institution with my wife uh, one night about six months ago, and we were looking at their latest technology that looked at the level of deforestation and could measure what was happening. And what came out of that was that the level of deforestation in the world is much more rapid and has progressed much further than the um, uh, UN latest looks at uh, this issue uh, uh, suggested uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And so climate change is actually much worse than the latest reports. What I said to Melinda is I said, we're, we're falling behind. And she said, what do you mean? And I said, climate change may be moving so rapidly and building so much momentum that if and when we get the solutions, it may be unstoppable, that we're past the tipping point. And so what I said to her is, and I said to our folks the next day when I talked about this, is we have to develop breakout strategies. And we have to identify channels and directions and strategies that will bump up in a quantum way uh, people's concern about climate change and their desire to find a way to play a role and be involved and make a difference. Because otherwise, this isn't going to end well. And so that's one of the reasons that I'm here speaking to, to young people and people in business school, and I'm reaching out to educational institutions. Because it occurred to me that you all haven't been sufficiently involved in the dialogue and the debate, and that young people can make a diff big difference. They did in my generation in the Vietnam War, uh, and they can in your generation. So I just want to communicate to you that I'm very concerned. I'm concerned about you all. I'm concerned about the fate of our children. Uh, and um, you all need to do whatever you can, as I am trying to do on this issue, uh, because it's a very serious one. It is, as Dick Meserve described, it is the greatest challenge mankind has ever faced. Uh, and um, the, we need to constantly educate people on this, uh, and we need to explain. And what I would say is I have a very good position, you know, from being CEO of our, our company to talk with really expert after expert on this issue. And I've talked to the critics and believe me, they, their, their quiver is empty. They do not, they talk a lot, and when they send me their reports and you know, say this shoots holes in what you have, uh, it, it's really, they've raised one good point about you know, some curve that really in the end doesn't make sense. Whereas there are volumes after volumes of work that have been done that have been reviewed in peer studies that have said this is a real problem. So, you have a great challenge in front of you. PG&E has a great challenge in front of you. But with great challenges come great opportunity. And so inspire us by the work you do in taking on this challenge and make a difference in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Donovan.